reading is taken from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1 in the Old Testament. You can find it on page 271 if you're following the Church Bibles. It would be good as ever for you to keep your Bibles open. And we take up the account of, Sam, of, Sam, of Samuel. His mother Hannah has, has prayed for a child. She's begged God for a child. And we take the account up in verse 19. So 1 Samuel 1, 19. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord. And then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you've weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of fat flour, and a skin of wine, and brought them to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli. And she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you, praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord, for his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, your word which speaks into our lives. As fresh today as it was the day your spirit first breathed it into, that, into the hearts of those who wrote it down for us. So Father, we ask that by your spirit that you would speak that word into our lives afresh. Please enable me to speak your word in truth. Lord, by your Spirit, please have your will and your way within us and among us. In Jesus' name, Amen. O oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Human beings so often try to second-guess Almighty God. We even tell him what we think he should do. Some say that they could not believe in a God who does X or Y. When God is as God is, whatever we can choose to believe about him. So often we try to put God in a box. We try to confine him with our expectations. It's, been, it's always been so. It's part of human nature. But God is greater than mere human beings. His ways and his wisdom are far beyond us. He is God, the creator. We are mere created things. Far better to seek his face to look to him who is God and to humbly seek the reality, not what we can believe, but who he actually is. God has revealed himself to us in his word and in his word we see him untamable and uncageable. The book of 1 Samuel begins at a time when Israel, God's people, were in a mess. It follows on straight on from the book of Judges. God's people had lost sight of him. The last verse of Judges reads, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did 
as they saw fit, or everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In those days, Israel had no king. Their king should have been God, but they put him behind their backs. He had given them his law, but they ignored it and did what was right in their own eyes. So he withdrew his hand from them and let them live with the consequences of living without him. The nation lost direction and vision. They went after the false gods of the nations round about. And those nations round about oppressed them, especially the Philistines. But God loved them and would not abandon them. And it's here that Hannah and her husband Elkanah come into the picture. God was going to do something special to rescue his people. And this couple were going to be an essential part of what God was going to do. At a time when many of God's people were abandoning him and doing what was right in their eyes, we meet Elkanah and Hannah, devout and observant Jews who sought to worship God and obey his commands, seeking to live to please God. These are the kind of people that God can use. Those who will come to him on his terms. Those who will worship him and honour him. And we see this in their actions. Last time when we began this series on the book of 1 Samuel, we met Hannah, who although devout, was unable to bear children. At a time when women were expected to bear many children, and it was seen to be their main role in life. Hannah was childless, and people would have seen her as being cursed. She was in deep distress. Her husband could not console her. His second wife, who had children, cruelly taunted and provoked her. And when she prayed to God, pouring out her heart in anguish to him, Eli, the high priest, accused her of being drunk. Yet Hannah continued to pray for a child. And she promised God that if he gave her a son, she would give him back to God to serve him. Now you might think that this was a rash promise, but Hannah meant it. In the face of disappointment and discouragement, she continued to seek God and continued to pray. So we read in verse 19 that the Lord remembered her. Her husband made love to her and she conceived. And nine months later she gave birth to a son. God answered her prayer, not for her comfort alone, but God was going to use this child whom she named Samuel, likely meaning heard by God, to rescue his people. We only see things at on our level. But God looks at the big picture. And the solution to one couple's misery was going to be the solution to the misery of a whole nation. The birth of Samuel is a shadow of what God would do with another child born miraculously over a thousand years later. Jesus Christ, not just the saviour of one nation from its earthly problems, but one who would be the saviour of the world. Samuel was a shadow of something far greater. For although miraculous, he was born in the natural way. Jesus is God himself made flesh. God who entered Mary's womb and took on our flesh and nature, becoming one of us. Samuel was called Samuel because God heard his mother's prayers. Jesus was called Jesus, meaning God saves, because he would save his people from their sins, Matthew 1. Jesus would save all who would come to him from our sins, from everything we do and are that are less than perfect, everything about us that causes us to fall short, everything imperfect that cuts us off from the all-holy God. Jesus came to us becoming one of us, living as one of us, 
coming to die for us, to make himself the sacrifice for our sin. In him we find forgiveness and reconciliation with God. In him we can be born again and find newness of life, life with an abundance that we could not have imagined before. Life with the quality of heaven about it. In Samuel we get a foreshadowing of what God can do and what he would do for us. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. God answered Hannah's prayer. And now came the time for her to fulfil her vow to God. We need to be careful what we promise, because God will call us to deliver on it. He is absolutely faithful to all his promises. All that he has promised, he will deliver. So we can bank on his promises, but can he bank on ours? Hannah was good to her promise. She kept her word, and Elkanah honoured her prom promise as well. Hannah kept the boy until he was weaned, and at that time it would be about the age of three. And then she took him to the tabernacle, verse 24. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, of all the same age as Samuel. An ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. Hannah came bringing a costly offering to offer the costliest thing of all, her firstborn son, Samuel. God had chosen Hannah and Elkanah because he knew their hearts, that they would honour their promise, and he would use their son to rescue and restore his people Israel. They offered their sacrifice and brought their son to Eli the high priest. And she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you, praying to the Lord. Verse 26. She could have added, I'm the same woman whom you accused of being drunk. But she didn't. Rather, she continued, I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. Hannah came to fulfil her vow. Who knows what this would have cost her? Who can imagine her feelings? But God had answered her prayers and she was determined to fulfil her vow. This was what God wanted of her. And in response, he would bless her amazingly. Because in chapter 2, we're told that God was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. God is no man's debtor. If we make good on our promises, if we're willing to sacrifice for him, he will bless. And Hannah was blessed. She not only got to continue to be involved in Samuel's life, but God blessed her with five more children. You might think that it was cruel to the boy Samuel, but he grew up, got to grow up in the presence of the Lord. And he grew up to be blessed and to serve God. And through him, God rescued his people and drew them closer to the coming of Jesus. In Jesus, God gave his all for us. For us and to us. For in Jesus, God gives us himself. In Jesus, God sacrificed himself. For Jesus was and is God, and he bore your sins and mine in his perfect soul, suffering all the horrors of the cross, that you might be forgiven, that you might come to God and find life. Oh, the depth, the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, 
how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things, including you and me. To him be glory forever. And after that burst of praise at what God has done for us, Paul continues, Therefore, in view of God's mercy, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Romans 12. God has been so merciful to us. He's given us himself that we might be saved from sin and death and hell. Jesus offered himself for you, that you might be reconciled to God, that you might know him and find life in him. So Paul urges us to offer a sacrifice to God in response to all that he has done. He doesn't call us to kill anything, as they did in the Old Testament sacrifices. Rather, he calls us to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. This is your true and proper worship. And the word that tra is translated as true and proper is an interesting one because it means both logical and reasonable. This offering of ourselves is the logical and reasonable response to the mercy of God, to what God has done for us. God gave Jesus to die and he calls us to respond by living to live as living sacrifice. A sacrifice is something totally give over, given over to God. In the Old Testament, people gave over the best of their animals, giving them over by killing them. Jesus died for us, and we're called to give ourselves over to him by living for him, holy and pleasing to God. Now the word holy means set apart, and this is how we're to live to set ourselves apart for him, living to please him. And the word translated as true and proper worship can also mean spiritual. And this giving of ourselves is a deeply spiritual thing. For as we give ourselves over, so the Holy Spirit fills us, guides us, and uses us to his glory. Paul puts it like this in Romans 6. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. For the moment we first believe, something amazing happens, because we die with Jesus. Our sin is taken with him into the tomb, and we're raised with him to newness of life. The moment we believe, this happens. We die with Christ and we're raised again with him to newness of life. So every day we need to offer ourselves on the altar of our love back to him who first loved us. And as we live as living sacrifices, so he fills us and we get to know him and to love him in ever increasing measure. Oh, the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that speaks into our lives. We thank you, Father, for there we see how you dealt with people and continue to deal with them today. And Father, we thank you that you get Jesus for us giving him to die, that we might live. Father, we thank you. And Lord, we offer ourselves to you afresh as living sacrifices, dead to sin, but alive to you. Grant us the grace to live for you and to daily be those living sacrifices that you desire that we might please you and honour you through Jesus.